Well, welcome everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to the Sign Institute's pre-debate series where we talk to experts in the field from various different perspectives about what to expect this season during our presidential and vice presidential debates. This debate series starts today as we see um, the first presidential debate will be tomorrow evening. So we wanted a perspective on what is expected and what's to come. I'd like to thank the Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies, who's also helping us sponsor some of these uh, debate conversations, as well as the, as the Women in Politics Institute, who's doing a special post debate um, reflection after the vice presidential debate this this uh, year. So please look at and sign up for all of them. They will all be different conversations as we progress during this debate season. And we're very excited to, to have you join us today. And please post questions during the conversation. We'll try to get them to as many as possible. So welcome. I'd like to introduce our distinguished guests today who are going to give us incredible perspectives on what's happening. Mike McCurry is the director of the Center for Public Theology and distinguished professor of public theology at the Wesley Theolo Theological Seminary, um, a, a neighbor of AU. And so we're, we're happy that he's joining us today. Mike has had nearly four decades of experience in Washington and served in the White House as press secretary to President Bill Clinton. But another interesting perspective, and we want to hear from him so much about today, is he's the former co-chair of the Commission on Presidential Debates, which actually organizes the fall general election debates between the major candidates for president and vice president of the United States. So welcome, Mike. In addition, we have David Wade. David is the former Chief of Staff to Secretary John Kerry. He's um, a communications expert on multiple campaigns in the US Center. Senate and founder of Greenlight Strategies. I will say that um, David has seen debate par participation for Kerry for his presidential race in 2004, um, in Vice President Biden's debate prep in 2008, and President Obama's 2012 debate prep. So I'm sure he's going to have a lot of insights for us as well today. And finally, we have Clarence Page, the 1989 Pulitzer Prize winner for commentary. He's a columnist syndicated nationally by Tribune Media Service and a member of Chicago Tribune's editorial board. And in a great way to all our young students there, he began his journalism career as a freelance writer and photographer for the Middletown Journal and Cincinnati Inquirer at the age of 17. And certainly, Clarence, you've covered uh, government and politics and yes, presidential debates for decades. So gentlemen, welcome to the conversation. We're so happy to have you here today. Thank you for having us. Yes, it's great to see great you. To it's so much to talk about. I know there's a buzz knowing that the presidential debates tomorrow. Why don't we just take a minute and get some reflections from you just about the importance of these debates, um, what to expect, and maybe we'll start with you, Mike, who's had to put them together before in several times. Well, they, they are now become kind of a traditional feature of American politics. Um, I think a very few people tune into these debates as undecided voters. I don't think they're watching the debates to sort of figure out who they're going to vote for. I think they're looking for something that will confirm the choice that they've made. They are looking for the person that they support to put forward an agenda, put forward ideas or a vision that they really want to embrace. Um, and I think they like to see what the interaction is between the candidates and how that works out. But uh, it, it's, it is great high theater in the world of, of national politics. And uh, uh, it's fun to be there and to be a part of it and put them on. It's a lot of work that goes into it. And I, I, I uh, think the commission has had a very hard time because normally they go to various colleges that they've picked. They have big audiences. It's a big, you know, event on campus, but it's all constrained now because of the virus. And they're going to have very small audiences, you know, maybe 50, 60 people inside the arena. So there's not going to be the kind of the applause or the uh, theatrical moments that you normally get. Uh, but it still is very high stakes. And it's, you know, it, it's the television audience that approaches 65 million people that will be watching this that uh, is really kind of the important thing, if, I think, from the perspective of the candidates. But uh, it, it is really a high wire act in national politics, to be sure. Well, it's really interesting that you say that, Mike, and especially during these times with a global pandemic, the access to, to these candidates at rallies and events 
it might make it, it'll be interesting the, the viewership tomorrow night because of that and, and the access. And as you say, if it's totally the, the, you know, theatrical, David, you've been behind this, the stage and behind the curtain putting these together. So, I mean, what are your, your thoughts about what's going to be happening in the next couple of weeks? Well, I think, number one, this is a, as Michael alluded to, this is a, these are going to be debates like none we've ever seen. I mean, any debate in which Donald Trump is a participant is always brings with it a whole different level uh, of uncertainty. Um, you know, I, when I was a part of the debate preparations in 2004 and 2008 and 2012, the mantra and the thread that ran through all of them, if you were preparing for a debate against President George W. Bush uh, or against Governor Sarah Palin or against Governor Mitt Romney, the mantra of what made good preparation uh, staff-wise was no surprises. That almost anything that came out of the opponent's mouth was something that had been road tested and rehearsed in debate prep. And the primary way that you would get that granularity and get that information was going through the daily transcripts of every interview, every rally. Uh, and you would even road test some responses uh, in your own rallies uh, in, in the walk up to the debate. All of that is completely different in a, in a campaign that much of it has lived on Zoom uh, and much of it has been uh, it has been in some ways sanitized, although President Trump obviously continues to do rallies. Um, but my takeaway is that perhaps even more so in a year like this where everyone is tuning in more, people are somewhat of a captive audience living life uh, as all of us are on Zoom, debates always matter. Debates are an opportunity for either a reset for a campaign that's coming in from behind, as it was for Kerry in 2004. Um, you may remember and Amy and, and Mike were, were part of that campaign and were traveling uh, during the time, but he came in largely being written off uh, heading into the first debate, pulling out of states, going off the air. There was a money challenge. There was, uh, obviously it was in a rough place in the polls. The headline, less than 48 hours, uh, of, of Newsweek was off the ropes. Uh, it Romney had a very similar experience in 2012. Uh, debates can matter, and they can also matter, as we know, even if what they, what they do is give a national audience having one of the rare and even more rare today common experiences in politics where a whole country sort of actually tunes in and watches the same 60 minutes or 90 minutes of an event occurring in front of them with two candidates uh, in front of their very eyes, uh, it gives them a chance to decide if their instinct about the candidates has been correct. And oftentimes, uh, it's actually in the reaffirming of those positions, as Mike said, uh, yeah. that the act is felt. So from your perspective, Clarence, you're the one writing the headlines, you know, leading up to and, and you know, talking about what the expectations are. As a journalist, like, what do you, what is the importance of these debates and you know how do you cover them and is that different over the years since you've been doing this well if i may digress for a moment into uh my relationship with debates i i i'm old enough to have seen uh, the uh nixon kennedy uh debate in 1960 the very first one uh which is i think generally recognized now as being the our introduction to a new media age uh, of, of politics really uh, a few years earlier, you I mean, we can go deeper into the history, uh, but uh, before that debate, uh, a few years earlier, there was, uh, there, there were uh, Stevenson-Eisenhower debates, but without Stevenson or Eisenhower. Uh, 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 Eleanor Roosevelt stood in uh, for the Democratic candidate, yeah. and uh, you had Margaret Chase Smith stood in for the Republican candidate. Uh, 1960 was the first uh, to have both candidates uh, there uh, on a camera live, uh, and I was uh, in junior high school. I just got through watching the Ed Sullivan show, which would give us the Beatles a few years later. And Ed Sullivan said, "No, no stay tuned for the first televised presidential debate." And I said, "Oh, this ought to be interesting." Uh, so I got to see the whole thing. A uh, little did I know that what twenty years later I'd be working at that TV station in Chicago. That's uh, I, I I have also, in fact, the the, the technical director. At, at Channel 2, a, a CBS station in Chicago, was one of the camera operators there in the, the 1960 debate. So I got some insight into why Nixon looked so miserable on camera. 
uh, and uh, uh, also I participated as a questioner in some mm -hmm. local debates there, uh, yeah. the local and state debates uh, in Illinois. So I've been on, on, on both sides of the line. And the one thing about that uh, uh, debate, uh, well, I would say Adlai Stevenson, former Illinois governor, uh, Democratic candidate for president uh, in uh, 56 and, uh, uh, and 52, uh, he um, uh, was, was urged to, to, to work with this new medium of, of TV, and he just turned his nose up at it and said, I refuse to be marketed like a box of soap. <laughs> and uh, Eisenhower, who, who wasn't much more enthusiastic than that, nevertheless, he did have some ads that, I'm sure they're on YouTube, everything's on YouTube. They're worth looking at, uh, mm -hmm. just so you can see how, how, how really simple they were. And, and you can see Eisenhower in one studio uh, talking to is that well I talks to America and and there would be uh, uh, your average American woman or average American kid uh, in another studio actually but you couldn't tell uh, uh, asking the questions and Ike would answer uh, in his kind of kind of wooden style but friendly uh, and that, that was a, it was an interesting breakthrough and in any case after that uh, certainly politicians got a little more respect for TV. Uh, but um, uh, no one more than, than Richard Nixon, who uh, uh, was uh, not telegenic and uh, you, just, you can say did everything wrong. We, we can talk more about that. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, that was the beginning. Nowadays, it is generally ag ag agreed that TV debates are just essential and you got to get ready for them. And just like we're talking about showbiz, this is that junction uh, between uh, entertainment and politics. So I brought along my copy of uh, Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death, which I recommend to all students and everybody okay. else. <laughs> I came out in 1984, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Neil Postman is no longer with us, uh, but it is worth reading. Uh, it, it, it's, it's really well written. I mean, just uh, uh, poetically written for, for, for people who aren't uh, in, into graduate studies or something. Uh, but what's interesting though is uh, uh, Postman uh, was concerned not about TV, uh, taking us in, into an age where people uh, uh, where people weren't reading uh, books, but he was worried about an age in which people would not want to read a book. And mm -hmm. he saw there in 1984, that was already starting to happen uh, with uh, the, the junction of the subtitle is Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business. Now this was, I, I think uh, I Donald Trump sure. at that time was still appearing on page six in the post uh, at right. Studio 54 or something, you know. Uh, but uh, he, the postman prophesied what's going on right now in some almost chilling ways, and uh, it's not pretty. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up. I, I want to kind of then segment a little bit into Mike. You, you've talked about this in your role as, as on the commission, and that's how it has now, it's almost like, Clarence, we're going into this next section of how is social media then changing the conversation, right? Because the question is, are all those people tuning in to see the debate or are they taking the pieces from social media to do that? And do they have to have an official role in these debates going forward? I know you have some thoughts on that, Mike. Um, I, I first wanna just, Clarence evoked the memory of that Nixon uh, <laughs> debate with John F. Kennedy. And remember, uh, Clarence, Sandy Van Oker was the moderator of that debate and kind of set a standard for that debate lasted forever but uh you know when when i did this my my daughter likes to say dad you were like a big wheel in politics but it was in the last century <laughs> and uh <laughs> right. and how oh, kind you know, we, <laughs> and my we son's did, the same thing <laughs> we did not have we didn't have to deal with facebook or twitter or social media that much it was just beginning to emerge um as a significant factor and it obviously has taken on a much bigger role now. And I, I know I'm no longer on the commission, but I know that they've been trying to figure out how do you engage more effectively with people who are not going to make this appointment television. They're not going to show up at, you know, nine o'clock tomorrow night and watch. They're going to want to watch it on YouTube or they're going to want to watch segments of it as they see fit in whatever time frame they have. And I think that puts a real challenge on the candidates to figure out how do you make the most effective argument and how do you reach the audiences that you think are critical that you have to persuade because of what your uh, political realities are. And I, I think it will change the nature of the debate because it's not, you know, it, it's, it, it still will be 
watched nationally and will be a big moment, but there'll be a lot of people who will encounter whatever happens in this debate in the aftermath. And so how the media covers it, what sound bites are effective, you know, what get, gets replayed uh, on the morning news the next day. I mean, that if, if you're in a campaign, you have to be thinking about all of those moments that uh, you're trying to create that will actually, you know, have some real impact down the road because it's, it's not something that, you know, most Americans watch for all 90 minutes straight through. Um, well, I think in another interesting way, you know, David, in 2008, you said that voters aren't tuning in for a vice presidential food fight when we were talking about the VP, you know, uh, debate in 2000. You said the debate is about two different philosophies of where to take the country. Is that what tonight's, tomorrow night's supposed to be about? Do you think that's what it will be about? Because at its core, debates are supposed to be talking about your stance on the issues, correct? Right. Uh, I mean, for, first of all, I was, and I, I should acknowledge, I was, uh, in that statement, I was engaging in the in the one tradition that has persisted in the age of Facebook still, which is the trying to trying to set some kind of expectations and trying to establish a little bit of a, a, a little bit of the stakes and, and the and the campaign's messaging and approach. The truth is, I, I think you know obviously in two thousand eight we had a real reason to want to elevate. The conversation have it be much more about big choices in, in front of the country, especially on the economy coming out of the financial collapse, and to avoid where many wanted to take us, which was to a very much a personality centric debate. Governor Sarah Palin, um, had, you know, had become this overnight uh, sensation who was being you know, portrayed by Tina Fey on Saturday Night Live. We wanted to get away from all of that. We wanted it to be. Uh, to be much more about the issues in the race and much less about the sort of tabloid dynamics. I think there's an even bigger um, uh, mandate and interest for, mm -hmm. for example, for the, for the Biden campaign heading into, into tomorrow night's de debate that, you know, any, that there's a philosophy sometimes that anytime the conversation is about Donald Trump uh, as showman and it's treated like show business to go back to uh, unfortunately, what Clarence talked about with the Neil Postman book that sort of previewed where our politics and our and our discourse was headed, that in some ways that's all, that's that's helpful to, to President Trump. I'm not. I don't actually think that an incumbent president with a record um, and and dealing with as many uh, unfolding crises as we have today that that can be the case. I think the country with 200,000 people. Uh, having died in our country from a pandemic, people are going to be approaching this with, with much more of a serious lens. Um, but, but obviously, you know, debates to some extent, even before we had gifts, debates did play out in gifts, right? So imagine the gif of President George H.W. Bush in 1992 checking his watch. You can imagine how that would play out on Twitter or Facebook. Um, but I, I do think, especially for the campaigns, both of them tomorrow night want to approach this and want to try to set a tone of either the Biden campaign presumably wanting this to really be a referendum on President Trump's handling mm -hmm. of the issue. And for the Trump campaign, probably trying to, because they know that they can't uh, affect the pre sort of the judgment the country's made about the president, them trying to make the race into much more of a choice uh, between two candidates and try to move the debate. Uh, to more favorable terrain for them. Well, this is interesting because, you know, Clarence, you said you've been on, especially with local um, races, you've been the moderator and then you've covered, you know, kind of uh, uh, also certainly these presidential debates. I guess the big question, to your point, David, if we're looking to drive, bo both have a goal for tomorrow night, both campaigns, what is the role of Chris Wallace, who is going to be moderating this debate? I mean, and what should it be? You know, in, in the past, the moderators really kept the time, kept things going back and forth, and panelists asked questions. What is his role, and what should it be uh, tomorrow night, Clarence? Well, the moderator uh, reminds me of what uh, 
uh, one of the uh, producers of, of uh, a, a mayoral debate that I, I was in uh, said, said beforehand, your job is like a nearsighted javelin thrower. You might not score many points, but you keep the crowd alert. And that's like, like that's kind of what happens uh, because- That's dangerous to, for tomorrow night. Let's <laughs> yeah, well, you don't want to be the news maker. You want to yeah. be one who generates news. Uh, and, and so that's why you don't want to ask softball questions that, 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 that I guess knock out of the park. Uh, you want to ask something that really creates some, some uh, no, puts them on the spot. Uh, so some, some, some kind of, kind of uh, uh, attention that, that, that really helps them, uh, well, helps the whole event to focus in on those issues. Uh, something that uh, uh, will uh, get them to say something that they uh, haven't said before or, or because they didn't want to or uh, they haven't had taken a position on it before and it's uh, now you know you know uh, David mentioned the uh, the uh, uh, coronavirus crisis uh, I, I expect to see some questions coming up about that but that is something on everybody's mind uh, and uh, President Trump is in that position now of being the incumbent who has to show what a good job he's doing, why you want more of him in that office. Uh, Joe Biden uh, has to show why you don't want more of him, how, how he, he's got the better answer. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so we, we've already had a preview of what they're going to say, but they gotta, you want them to say something they, they haven't told us before. And so that's, and then you want to get out of the way. Uh, I think Mike mentioned this earlier. Uh, because uh, they are there for, for uh, I don't want to step on one of your great anecdotes there, Mike, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm just reminded of, but I, I, I've spoken at, at graduation ceremonies and somebody, well, my wife said, remember, honey, all these students are not here to hear you. <laughs> and, <laughs> every commencement speaker needs to remember that. Right. So that, the same thing with debate moderators. Well, you know, but it's interesting because he also, Chris, outlined a, a series of topics that he planned to cover, plans to cover. The Trump-Biden records, uh, the Supreme Court, COVID-19, the economy, race and violence in our cities, and the integrity of the election. But the question is, is he... Is he, should he be asking them on straight policy line questions or there's also the news of the day. I mean, there's certainly the news is being consumed right now about the Trump tax records. Is he, you know, should he be asking these questions about the news of the day or should he let, you know, the opponents ask of each other? I mean, it's just, I'm trying to figure that out. Maybe David or, or Mike, from your experience on, you know, the campaign side, like what, what is, What's going to happen there? I mean, how much is the news of the day going to be injected into these policy discussions? Well, let, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. You know, the role of the moderator is not the same as being someone who's quizzing uh, these candidates if you're on a cable television news show or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's really not to try to elicit news. I take a little bit of exception with what Clarence said on that. You're not trying to go for the headline you're trying to make this a format in which you actually elicit from the candidates some real discussion about the differences that they have. Let me go back a little bit and talk about the format. Um, this was a big change that the Commission on Presidential Debates made, which is, you know, we used to have these very highly regulated debate formats where you would have a two minute opening statement and then a 90 second rebuttal. And, you know, it was very highly structured. And we elected uh, to go to a format in which were, th there were these 15 minute blocks of time in which you know, the candidates, the moderators could announce the subjects as Chris Wallace has done, but it was really up to the candidates to engage each other because it's really their debate. It's really not about the moderator. It's not the moderator's role is not to fact check. I mean, the one time that that happened when Candy Crowley did it, Candy Crowley from CNN, mm -hmm. she got blistered for having tried to inject a fact check into the content of the debate. So I think the moderator really is is basically, you know, put the ball in play and let the let the candidates do what they want to do, and it's up to the candidates to challenge each other, to question each other, to raise points of difference, and to uh, challenge certain facts that are presented and you know that 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 is a it's kind of a moderate moderator light format uh, because it's it's not you know the moderator doesn't need to be the center of attention and I think most moderators that 
do this, you know, want to be in the background. And like Clarence said, they want to turn it over to the candidates and let the candidates take uh, the debate where they want to take it. And I think that that is critically important. Be you know, do they engage? Do they want to engage? Do they have things that they want to say to each other? Uh, do they challenge each other? Uh, that's all part of the theater of the debate itself. And I think that that's what you know you you will watch played out tomorrow night. It, it is different this time around because we've got Donald Trump, and Donald Trump is just you know, kind of a haphazardly goes about raising the points that he wants to raise. And, you know, you, you never know what is actually going to come out of his mouth. And I think that that's a challenge for Joe Biden. Joe Biden has got to have some strategy to stick with what he's talking about. But then he, he can't just ignore any crazy thing that Trump says. He's going to have to confront and challenge. And uh, how that happens and how that plays out will be one of the things I think we we tune into tomorrow night. Yeah. Well, it, you know, and, and presumably both campaigns uh, are going into this knowing where either there's a part of their base that they still need to rev up and excite, uh, some repair jobs that they have to make to their coalitions, potentially some some ways to reach some voters who remain undecided. But, but the, uh, you know, I think the one takeaway watching a lot of presidential debates is that now, the moderator's job is it, obviously it, it is to not be the story, but audiences themselves uh, and that home, that audience watching at home have a pretty good track record of making judgments about what they don't like in terms of how a candidate behaves in these settings, right? I mean, for many people who were watching the debates in 2000, we all remember between Vice President Gore and Governor Bush, um, and who were watching it and sort of journalists sort of grading the debates about some of those traditional categories of who got the policy right, who had the most detailed plans, who actually answered the questions, it made one judgment that Vice President Gore did pretty well. An audience at home, uh, after the debate, when the consensus really sunk in, that audience said, we don't like the way that Vice President Gore sighs. Yeah, we think it's rude. We don't like the way that he interrupts his opponent, we don't like the way that he invaded somebody's space. You've seen that over the years, which I actually think is a good caution sometimes to candidates, not to President Trump who plays by his own set of rules, but it's typically been a, a caution to other candidates not to behave in certain ways that step on the format, filibuster, avoid the questions, uh, and things like that. Well, you bring up a good point, David, and I'm very curious, Clarence, for somebody who will write I'm sure something to kind of analyze these debates. How much is it about substance and how much is it about style and the way they carry themselves? What do you think it's important for you to report on uh, for Tuesday night? And what, what are journalists looking for as they kind of pick these apart? Yeah, well, as, as you've gathered already, uh, uh, substance and style both matter. Uh, mm -hmm. But when I think about a TV debate, and here's the aspect that uh, troubles a lot of folks who worry about entertainment taking over. Uh, I think, and you gentlemen tell me if I'm wrong, I think the number, the portion of undecideds out there is still about 15% or something like that. I mean, it's a small minority uh, mm -hmm. that hasn't made up their minds in this race, especially. Uh, and so uh, what, how much difference can a debate make anyway? Well, any, if you're a candidate, anything you can do to chip into that 15%, you're going to do it. Uh, and uh, that might be style, it may be substance. And in that style-substance debate, I'm always reminded of the line attributed to Maya Angelou, who, who was not the first to say it, but she gets quoted on it probably more often, uh, that uh, it doesn't matter. Well, uh, uh, people won't remember what you say, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. Yeah. And that's a big thing. You know, touchy-feely politics has been <laughs> denigrated by a lot of folks, including me, especially. But I got more respect for it in recent years because I've seen things. I mean, Al Gore, uh, as was just mentioned, Al Gore uh, roamed around the stage a little bit there and uh, was uh, 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 criticized for it. Uh, Donald Trump roamed around the stage during a debate with Hillary Clinton, and it didn't hurt him with his base, certainly. Uh, uh, he won the election anyway. Uh, and, uh, he uh, uh, seldom answered a question directly without uh, veering off rather quickly into some digression, uh, but he still won anyway. 
people are going to uh, you know look back at those exceptions and say, well, you know, uh, the, the rules get broken all the time. So uh, the question is, uh, how do you make people feel? Uh, well, I, I think about uh, Al Gore and uh, and George W. Uh, I watched those debates, and you know, I thought, uh, well, you know. George W. is a nice man. I have met both these these gentlemen professionally, and I, I like them both as, as, as just people, you know. But I, I said, well, you know, George, George W., a great guy to have a beer with, as the line goes. Uh, Al uh, is um, two people on camera. He gets real wooden and stiff and professorial. Uh, off camera, he's great to have a beer with, too. Uh, and I, I, I think uh, he's loosened up a, a lot more since then. I hear a lot of other people saying that as well. But uh, there was this tendency. Uh, that occurred. Uh, a, lot, a lot of folks noted that that George W. Uh, seemed like the guy you knew in high school who uh, was, how we say, uh, earned a good gentleman's C at best <laughs> academically. Yeah. But everybody liked him. He knew everybody's name, and and uh, he, uh, he was a very warm uh, person who got right up to the microphone. Uh, Al uh, was a nice guy uh, who was uh, more intellectually distant. He was that straight A student whose parents loved how he performed and all the other parents wanted you to be like him, you know, yeah. but there, there was, you know, it's a different feeling you get. And so that's where the show biz comes in. What do you project on camera? And so that's what, uh, what I'll be watching. Well, it's interesting because, and also you mentioned, Clarence, like this very small amount of undecided voters. So uh, one of our students, Aiden, has the question about what's the impact of these presidential debates on swing undecided voters? And has that been diluted because of social media? Is that really the audience when you think about stubs, substance, and style? I mean, Mike, who are these candidates talking to tomorrow night? Are, th are they trying to reach those undecided swing voters or are they, try are they trying to accomplish a lot of goals? Um, by the time of these debates, the, the can, campaigns really have a very precise understanding of who the persuadable vote is, as we call them, and it's a very small fraction. And so what they're trying to do, as we talked about earlier, is they're trying to firm up their base, firm up their support, make people enthusiastic about going out to vote. And I, I want to pick up on something that Clarence said. If you, you think back, at, you know, as we remember the debates that we've watched and seen, we probably remember very little about substantively what was discussed. I mean, we, we I, actually, I do, <clears throat> do remember that climate change was not a subject that really got raised in any of the 2016 debates in any serious way. And I think that's a shortcoming. But, but there are very few substantive issues that we remember. We remember the style, remember what they looked like on stage, how they behaved, you know, how they, you know, Bill Clinton approaching the woman who asked a question and George Bush looking at his watch. And, you know, those are the moments that really stick out and that create some kind of sense of who the candidates really are. Now, I, I do think people watch these debates and they want to hear their agenda reflected. They want to sort of say, okay, this is my guy because he's talked about this issue and that issue and that's what I care about. But it really is more, at the end of the day, the personality and the style that I think really determines who the winners and losers are. And, and that I think will certainly be true tomorrow night. Well, you know, it's interesting because you talk about the issues and what's being brought up one of the, the topics that Chris Wallace wants to talk about is the Trump versus Biden records. And, you know, David, as somebody who's helped do debate prep for a public official who's been, you know, in office for a very long time, had a very long record, these are two very different records, right? I mean, when you look at Trump, first of all, he is an incumbent, so he's running on a record. That's different than 2016. But it's much smaller than the long public service record that Biden has. Is that an advantage? Is that a disadvantage? How do you navigate 30 years of public service when you're talking about? And that's a big topic that he's going to talk about. Well, I think, you know, and I, I think anybody who has worked on debate prep for somebody who has a long, long record, uh, you face a challenge between what is just enough information to communicate that defends positions and votes that can be obviously be taken out of context or things that don't wear as well that made sense 30 years ago and are harder for a modern audience to digest. That's always a challenge. And I think it's often a struggle with a candidate with candidates who obviously uh, are, you don't get to be on that stage if you're not a capable communicator. 
and they've spent decades convincing themselves that they can explain anything. Uh, and oftentimes they can't. But I do think fundamentally, as you're preparing for a debate, you want to think about in 90 precious minutes that are going to fly by and that are going to feel like they're much shorter. What is, what is the best way to maximize that time? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it's very rare uh, that, that a candidate wants to, we used to always say, you don't want to chase a rabbit. You don't want to lose time where you could be communicating your core message. Uh, instead, defending the nuances and the details of votes or positions that aren't relevant as relevant to today's choice. That said, you have to find ways to deflect, to defend and deflect, and deflect quickly, because I think voters also can hear a cue that somebody doesn't want to talk about something for a reason, uh, and that perhaps a suspicion that they have as a voter might be true. And you don't want to look evasive, you don't want to look slippery, uh, and you certainly don't want to look like you know, a question about your record, which is which is seen by the audience as an accusation, that you just let it go because then they just assume, well, it, it must be true. Mm. Uh, certainly, you know, President Trump is going to be, uh, you would imagine, is going to be aggressive trying, again, since his strategy has to be to try to make this a choice, uh, in his mind, you know, a choice between two records. I think he would much rather be talking about a long, senatorial voting record or a record from the 1970s than he would his own record, uh, especially of this last year of pandemic. Well, another piece of this, and I, and I wanted to ask you, Clarence, because you certainly wrote about this in the primary debates. You, you talked a lot about that you mentioned in these primary debates that some candidates stumbled on the questions around race, especially when it came to economic disparity. And you've written a lot about this. And I ask you because one of the topics Chris Wallace said that is gonna be addressed tomorrow night is race and violence in our cities. That's how he termed the conversation. What do you think has to happen for these two white male candidates to have a conversation with communities of color around race tomorrow night? Yeah, uh, well, here's the challenge each of them faces that, that, that uh, Donald Trump has uh, staked his ground on, on the uh, law and order uh, mm -hmm. agenda, uh, uh, because it, it, for one thing, it helps to d distract attention away from the pandemic uh, and, and how he's handled that. And he scored very poorly in, in uh, uh, approval ratings for that performance. Uh, law and order is something he sees uh, working for him the way it worked for Richard Nixon back in the 60s. Uh, and uh, in other words, frighten the suburbanites. He's losing that, that key demographic of his, the, the suburban swing voters, especially women. And he's hoping that, he, uh, and you can see this in his TV ads, you know, he's hoping to scare them on, on, on uh, um, that level. Uh, Joe Biden, uh, on the other hand, has a, uh, a, a middle of the road center, uh, center right, really, uh, record on law and order, if you will, viewed through the lens of today. Uh, this is why his uh, 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 proud sponsorship of the 1994 crime bill, uh, he was proud at that time. Now <laughs> the crime bill is looked upon very poorly by the uh, progressive wing of his party. Uh, and uh, he knows why. And uh, he's taken some actions there uh, internally while he was in, in the Senate uh, to, to modify it because of what it did for, as far as uh, uh, a black incarceration. And uh, uh, he, uh, he's got an answer for it. But uh, as um, was just said, uh, the, uh, he has to be careful not to chase that rabbit. Uh, it's an important issue, uh, but uh, he has to not come across as too defensive about it. Uh, it's then put, uh, put uh, President Trump on the offensive. How much good has your law and order approach done, sir? That's what, you, that's what, that's what he wants to do, uh, because uh, even in Kenosha, Wisconsin, which uh, is Wisconsin's very key state, uh, after uh, all, all of his uh, uh, but uh, public relations actions there and uh, sending in federal uh, help and all. Uh, the, uh, Joe Biden is still uh, performing quite well in Wisconsin, didn't make uh, much of a difference. So this is not 1968 anymore. Uh, so I think that's a very key issue on so many different levels yeah. that we are, are bound to see come up. And uh, we'll see some more like that. Yeah, I think it'll be a big part of tomorrow night. Um, again, going maybe back a little bit to the, the, the style part of it, um, Mark has a question for us. He actually asked you specifically, Mike, so I'll give you this one. Um, how can Biden get his argument made and still counter Trump's statements that are off point or probably insulting? Um, 
He says, how does Biden counter likely insults, ignore, or respond? He, he gave a reference. Does he need his own one-liners like Reagan's, there you go again? I mean, how do you see that being effective? Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, 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 it's kind of hard to respond. And if you try to respond substantively to all the points, you're going to get lost. So my recommendation would be humor. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Biden has to be funny and has to kind of like almost make fun of Trump. And, you know, that, that will drive Trump crazy. But if he does it in an effective way and just gets under Trump's skin, uh, he could really provoke some moments that would not be good for the president and might be good for, for Biden. And Biden's got kind of a naturally garrulous uh, you know, uh, perspective most of the time anyhow. So he might actually be pretty effective at doing that. But but I would not try to counter every substantive argument. I would just sort of come up with something equivalent to there you go again, which sets the context for, you know, you're just so far out of it, Donald Trump, that you don't, you don't get it. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's the mood that he has to create, I think, in the debate. It's just like this, this guy is just sort of out of touch with what most of America cares about. And he's got his 40 percent or whatever, but, you know, that, that's all he's got. And he doesn't have the rest of it. And, and so peeling off those people who are, you know, they're not, there aren't that many people who are undecided or independent, as we've already discussed. Yeah. But there are a lot of people who are looking for some affirmation that Biden really has the ability to lead and to motivate and to inspire us. And I think that's his primary challenge tomorrow night is to give us some vision or some inspiration that really makes us feel like, you know, the country's going to be better off if this guy is president. And, you know, he's not exactly done that so far in the campaign, not to be critical. I don't want to be too critical because I'll get in trouble. <laughs> but, but you know, I think I think that's, you know, presidential politics at the end of the day is about what vision do you paint for the future of the country. Nobody cares about the past. Nobody cares about what happened six months ago or six years ago. They really want to know what's in it for them. You know, what's going to change in my life? How's my family going to be affected by this choice? And the best campaigns are the ones that actually address that vision question with, you know, some real element of uh, surprise or imagination or something that really makes people come alive and wake up and say, wow, you know, that, that's something I hadn't heard before. And uh, that, that is Biden's challenge, in my opinion. Trump is fairly predictable. I mean, we know what we're going to get from Trump. We're going to get kind of angry, hostile bromides, and he's going to try to get under Biden's skin and try to provoke Biden. And, you know, that's pretty predictable. But it's really up to Biden to provide something that's different, which is a vision of the country that people sort of say, now that is what a president sounds like in my mind. And uh, that's the kind of thing I want to hear. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, and, and it was interesting watching also the two conventions. It, it was striking to me, sometimes there wasn't, you, you can't just be against something. You have to show what you're for too. So it sounds like these candidates are going to, you know, to be successful, have to present both of those sides right. of that argument in order to do that. I, I do want to ask though, kind of as a follow-up, Linnea had a question, David, that I think, you know, it'll be interesting as somebody who sat in those debate preps and thought through either the one-liners or the tactics. Like, her question is, both candidates have been attacking each other, you know, before the debate about their public speaking abilities. And so do you think, do you anticipate the candidates will confront each other on that issue? And if so, do you think it will have effect on the voters? I mean, I guess that's another, you see what plays out in the before and how are, how are these campaigns preparing for that? And it has been something they've both done publicly. No, I... I I would say that I would be surprised if, if that happened, um, but you know, but but in saying that, I'd be violating what has been the one consistent rule of watching Donald Trump, which is that if if you think he won't say it, he probably will. Um, but but the reason that you would think that, that that I would think that would not be the case is to something that that Mike alluded to before, which is voters, and particularly if there are undecided voters, they are tuning in 
to hear about them and to hear about what this person is going to do for, for potentially for their lives, whether they believe presidents are capable of doing that anymore, maybe a different story, but that's, they are tuning in to find out, can this person relate to me? Does this person care about me? Does this person have a set of answers for me? Um, and I think that that is always a trap then if, if you're a candidate and you're, the things that you are choosing to use that, those very limited 90 minutes for a scene unusually personal, unusually um, you know, directed at your opponent in ways that don't have to do uh, with the general election. I also think, I also think it's a trap, right? I mean, if you look back, because the, the reality is every time Donald Trump brings up uh, things like saying that Biden is somehow taking per, you know, performance enhancing drugs, some of these ludicrous statements, he's really trying to make it, in his, make, make it an issue about competence and age. And I think when somebody does that directly in a debate or when they have set those expectations, to go back to Mike's point, you know, and you think about Ronald Reagan in 1984 when he talked about his opponent's youth and inexperience, in some ways you were inviting someone to come in with a really smart, really well-prepared piece of humor that absolutely takes that issue away and takes that issue off the table. I also think it's a mistake because in some ways you're lowering the bar for your opponent. If you are constantly saying that your opponent can't communicate, is senile, doesn't make sense, and that person comes in and delivers a, a competent performance in a debate, they've taken that issue completely off the table when it was an issue that you actually raised the stakes on in ways that didn't, didn't prove to be smart in the long run. Um, we have another question, and I think I'm going to direct this to you, Clarence, because like you have, you know, um, moderated on debates too. I think the question is, one of our students wants to know, have you ever seen an example in these presidential debates where one of these moderators brings their biases to the table? I mean, I think they're all incredibly professional. We've seen the list of the lineup. Have you, has there ever been a moment um, where that's been displayed, do you think? Uh, I, I don't recall a moment of uh, uh, someone actually purposely bringing uh, bias to the table. I, I know many cases where uh, moderators have been or questioners have been accused of bias. Uh, the, there was a uh, mentioned, uh, I think Mike mentioned uh, Candy Crowley uh, earlier uh, with uh, her uh, fact checking. Uh, my, my friend Bernard Shaw, uh, who asked that, that memorable question, uh, many, many say, say cr crucial, that capital punishment question to Michael Dukakis, uh, which he responded honestly and rather cold heartedly in a lot of viewers' opinions. And uh, uh, many folks say you could just uh, hear his approval numbers tumble, uh, not because of the logic of what he said, but because of his appearance to be disengaged from it. Uh, was that Bernie's fault? A lot of folks criticized him for it. Uh, 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 and, and how do you criticize a reporter for, for doing his job, you know, asking questions? And that's what he did. But uh, I, um, I mean, if you gentlemen have any other examples uh, that I, I've missed, I'd love to hear it. Um, I'll offer up one, which is actually a good example, which is Martha Raddatz from ABC. When she moderated the debate, she is a, you know, she is a professionally consummate person covering foreign policy. And so she drilled down a lot on foreign policy questions. And, you know, frankly, a lot of Americans find that stuff boring. Uh, hopefully not anymore because we've actually seen what the consequences are. But I think she got, she took a little bit of a hit for doing too much on foreign policy. And that was, you know, kind of her bias because that was, that's the beat that she covered naturally. But uh, I, I thought that was actually a perfectly appropriate <laughs> direction for the debates to go. Well, it's, it's interesting as well, because when you think of these debates, and, and it's kind of a question for all of you, I know it's, it's something that you've had experience with, Mike, but one of the um, people asked the question, but wait, you said they're, they're kind of like, they're not, it, this isn't in the Constitution that you have to have these debates, right? But they, but they become institutionalized. Is there a scenario where one of these candidates just doesn't have a good experience tomorrow night, voters are already voting, and they decide, I'm not going to do this anymore? It's possible, right? Yeah, yeah let, let me 
let me trace through that a little bit. You know, we, we had kind of debates about debates all the way through the 1970s and 1980s, which is one of the reasons why then the two political party chairmen, Frank Farenkopf and Paul Kirk, came together and created the Commission on Debates. Because they said, we need to have regular debates. They need to be well-structured. They need to be run well and well-moderated. Um, they did not, by the way, ever say that they ought to be exclusively for Republicans and Democrats. I mean, the standard has always been if you are a candidate running for president, you get to 15 percent support uh, in the polls, you, you'd be invited to be on the stage, too. And we, we had at least one case with Ross Perot where that actually happened. Um, but I, I, I think making these debates regular, even though they're not required, there's no federal statute that mandates it. By the way, the commission doesn't get any money from the federal government to run these debates. It's all independently financed. Yeah, I think that's um, important to note. Most people don't know that. It's yeah, not. yeah. It's not, you know, it's not in the federal budget that we have presidential debates. Um, so they, they, you know, but they get good support from corporations that want to lend their name to it. And, you know, they, the corporations get, you know, some VIP treatment as a result of that. But, uh, you know, it, it has been just assumed that we would see these candidates face to face in debates. Now, it is perfectly plausible to me that if Trump has a very bad night on Tuesday, he said, why don't, you know, this is all rigged. And I'm not going to do any more of these debates. It's all rigged. And this commission is rigged. Um, he has actually said that in the past. Uh, just said it's all a bunch of anti-Trump people who are on this commission, which is def definitely not true. I mean, the, the quality of that commission, the people who are on it is, you know, pretty exemplary. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it, it's anybody's guess what will happen. And sometimes- a, Just a quick follow-up. If one candidate were to drop out, is there a rule that you can still have a conversation with, with a candidate that wants to participate or are they, I know it's unprecedented, so I don't know if there's a rule for that. There, there's no rule. It's just like, you know, what would you do? I think the commission, you know, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of the commission, but I think they would take a dim view of, you know, putting an empty chair on the stage or something like that, because that's not what we're really about. We're really about trying to, you know, bring the candidates the American people are really interested in seeing and bring them together to have a conversation. And it's not a conversation if you just got one person on the stage. So my guess is that they would have to probably uh, cancel the, the re if, if Trump pulls out and says, I'm not doing any more of these, then I think there's not, you know, there's no debate. And then he, he pays the political price then for ducking the debate. And I think Biden would probably have a heyday with that. But uh, that, that's the way the process would unfold. Yeah, I, I have to ask you as somebody who's run, you know, communications, been a part of the team that then, you know, we talked about before and then during the debates, the after the debates will matter too, right? The analysis, like what could happen. Um, it's interesting, you mentioned, do people remember the who won, who lost? I mean, does that stay with them? And in a sense, if Clarence is, a hypothetical, Clarence is writing an article tomorrow based on your candidate's performance, what's the worst headline that they could write, you know, for that day after? What would be the most difficult thing to try and then, you know, address after a debate night? Well, and it's, you know, it, it, I, I, I do think, again, historically, uh, especially recently, it's interesting how much it becomes it becomes a meme uh, about an attribute or about one moment rather than the aggregate of, of who of who won a debate. You know, I mean, Gore Gore two thousand is that that ultimate example of somebody who on the insta polls was doing pretty well, and then by the next morning, when the entire discussion and the audio was of sigh after sigh after sigh. The whole conversation changed to be about personality, which, which I think at the, at the time was generally seen as a much more favorable terrain for the Bush campaign. And so, you know, I, I always I remember in 2004 uh, during debate prep, the conversations about, you know, we had, we had two challenges, right? We had agreed that the, the Kerry campaign with Vernon Jordan's, what turned out to be really brilliant negotiating, had agreed to uh, to 
green and red lights that would show uh, when your speaking time was up. And at the time, the conventional wisdom was that's terrible for a United States Senator. United States Senators are used to filibustering and speaking all the time. That's going to be a problem. And so one of the one of the conversations then in debate prep was what's the bigger risk? Do you wear a watch so that you can time yourself and look down occasionally and make sure that you're not running over and that you're not playing into that caricature and that God forbid, you know, a senator uh, doesn't have to be interrupted and stopped a bunch of times by the moderators and look like the windbag? Or is the greater risk that you have a watch to keep you on time, you look down and you've recreated a 1992 Bush 41 moment? So, you know, I, I think, I think, I presume both candidates have thought about some of those potential and have probably made some calculations about how to guard against them so that they don't become the meme the morning after that ends up dominating the, the conversation and that instead you're on a train that they either of them have decided is where they want to be. Yeah, I think it's important to note. I mean, we've got just a couple of minutes. We, we were able to answer most questions. There's a couple um, that uh, we'll try to, to, to get in or, or certainly respond to in another way. But I did want to get some final thoughts. I'm assuming that you're all going to be watching the debate tomorrow night or, you know, certainly following it. What are you looking for tomorrow night as somebody who's been someone who's set them up, who's, who's certainly been in the debate prep, who's, who's tried to spin them afterward, who's written about them for decades. Like, what are you looking for tomorrow night? Let's, let's start with Clarence. Like, what, what are you expecting to see or what are you going to pay a particular attention to? Well, since we've seen both of these gentlemen debate before, I want to see what's new. How much of their former debating style do they change this time? Uh, Joe Biden, uh, has a tip, was just talking about having red lights or green lights. Both of these guys are, are known for talking on and on and on. Uh, and uh, so you might need a checkered flag or something out there. But uh, uh, will uh, Joe Biden uh, be more focused uh, and less anecdotal? Uh, I think he's all, all, that was always a strength of his. You know, good old Joe, just, just uh, talking straight from the heart. Uh, and uh, can, he, can he, will he toughen up? Uh, will he try to be as snide and sarcastic as Donald Trump? That's a hard game to play because it kind of runs against his natural personality. Uh, but uh, yeah, in, in the zinger game, if he can come back with one like Ronald Reagan did at that moment that uh, I just, uh, uh, just dismissed the uh, age issue uh, right there on the spot, uh, then that would be uh, dramatic uh, and uh, something well worth waiting for. Uh, for. For Donald Trump, uh, will he be different than he was last time uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, focusing more himself and uh, being able to stay on topic? And uh, what am I talking about? That's not Donald Trump. He just, I, I just, you know, you can't squeeze that into a can somewhere. He's going to do it his way and uh, uh, sink or swim. Uh, that worked for him well enough to win the Electoral College four years ago. Uh, will it work, uh, work for him again? And we will see. David? I, I would just say, I mean, 1984, 2004, and 2012, there's been a little bit of kind of a, a jinx of incumbent presidents having a bad first debate. Uh, I think the right. nature of the office, they're not used to being challenged with sometimes with adversarial questions, either from a moderator where oftentimes they're able to to often cherry pick the interviews that they do let alone from an opponent uh there's a little bit about the office i think that sometimes people faced with the weight of those day-to-day -day challenges uh it, it, it's almost inherent that they look down upon the person who just has been get, kind of giving speeches and being a challenger to them and and i think often for that reason you've seen incumbents in the, especially in the first debate be off their game It'll be interesting to see President Trump, who is such an unusual president to begin with. But what, what is he like in this setting, having been largely in front of very friendly conservative media when he chooses to do long sit downs for the most part, uh, let alone not being on a stage with one opponent who's, who's going to be presenting a, a choice? How does he handle that moment? It'll be interesting to see. Mike, your thoughts? Well, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to close with two quick stories, if you will indulge me. One, 
1996 in debate prep when we were up in New York getting ready for uh, the first debate, my job was to play Jim Lair. And I did an absolutely awful job of, of being the moderator. They kind of kept me quarantined off on the side so I wouldn't kind of know what all the expectations were. But the, the questions that I asked were far too detailed and substantive because Jim Style, and he's actually written a book about this, mm -hmm. uh, is just to sort of say, well, what do you think? You know, what's your answer, Senator? You know, I mean, he, he, he does not put a lot of substantive, uh, you know, background into the question. He's just trying to get the candidates to engage. So I kind of botched it on that. And then the, the other role that I played was to play Dan Quayle in the preparation for the debates that Lloyd Benson had with Quayle. And <clears throat> the story I would tell about that, because it's probably one of the most memorable lines from any uh, presidential, vice presidential debate was, you know, you're no JFK. And I, I, I at one point mimicking Quayle, I went into this whole thing about I'm you know, representative of that new generation that John F. Kennedy passed the torch to, I went on. And I remember Senator Benson looked at me and said, he cannot possibly compare himself to John F. Kennedy, can he? And people said, well, yeah, yes, yes, sir. You know, that's, that, that's kind of in the record here. Here's what he says. And he just shook his head. He said, well, he's no more John F. Kennedy than man in the moon. And that, that was it. And so <clears throat> there was no rehearsal of that moment that we know is so famous, which he looks at Quayle and says, you're no John F. Kennedy. By the way, that moment worked because the camera was on Quayle. This was before the era of split screens. That's a good point. Yeah. And if, 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 they, if the camera had been on Benson, Benson might have looked a little bit angry. In fact, his wife was very upset at the end of it because he said, well, Lloyd came off so angry and upset and like an angry old man and that. And we all said, no, ma'am, we think that probably worked pretty well. <laughs> pretty well. But uh, it just shows you that the change in the technology and how these things are televised and, and you know, and, and the, the question, the, the point is, the preparation cannot substitute for those moments that are genuine and authentic. So what I will look for tomorrow night is when do we get the glimpse of who these candidates really are and what really comes across to the American people. And that, you know, there's, it's almost entirely unpredictable and probably no way in which campaign staffs can really prepare for that because it's really what the candidates put out there when they're on the stage, which is what makes it such an interesting, beautiful experience in democracy. Well, I want to thank all of you. I could go on for hours, but I so appreciate you being our panel to really give us a preview and insight to this very first presidential debate, which I I predict we'll have record numbers watching. I think people will be interested. Um, on behalf of the Sign Institute, I'd love to welcome you all back on campus when our students are back so that you can spend some time with them in person. I'm sure that they would really enjoy hearing from you. Our next event uh, is October um, 8th. We're doing uh, a post vice presidential debate review at 6 p.m. So please look out for that and register as you can. And then we'll also have some pre-debates on October 14th and October 21st with some other experts, interesting perspectives in this, in this place. It's such an important part of our system. It's certainly something that has become this tradition and the next phase we talk about in presidential campaigns. So we'll have all eyes on that. Thanks to everybody who participated and asked questions. Please sign up on our social media accounts and get our newsletter. There's a lot more programming and interesting things to come. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate having you on. Thank you, Amy. Good. Thank Take you. Care.